Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Turning Up the Heat on Thyroid Hormone Analysis with LC, ICT, MS. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Agilent Technology. Agilent is a leader in life sciences, diagnostics, and applied chemical markets. The company provides laboratories worldwide with instruments, services, consumables, applications, and expertise, enabling customers to gain the insights they seek. Agilent's expertise and trusted collaboration give them the highest confidence in the company's solutions. To learn more, visit www.agilent.com. Let's get started. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credit. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credit. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speaker, Frederick Strathman, PhD, Vice President of Quality Assurance at NMS Labs. Prior to his current position, Dr. Strathman was a medical director of toxicology and director of high-complexity platforms, mass spectrometry, at ARUP Laboratories, and a tenure-track assistant professor of pathology at the University of Utah School of Medicine. He received a MS and PhD in pathology and laboratory medicine from the University of Rochester in New York, conducted an academic postdoctoral fellowship in the Biomedical Genetics Department at the University of Rochester, and completed a COMAC accredited clinical chemistry fellowship at the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Strathman is board certified in clinical chemistry and toxicological chemistry by the American Board of Clinical Chemistry. Dr. Strathman will now begin his presentation. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, certainly thank you to LabRoots and to Agilent as well. Uh, for putting this on, Agilent for sponsoring uh, this session, and then certainly to all of you who are in attendance and listening um, uh, all over the place from what I can see in regards to uh, where everybody's location is. So I think that's really great. Shows a lot of interest in uh, ICPMS and mass spectrometry. Um, very exciting time, I think, to be affiliated with mass spectrometry and clinical laboratory medicine, uh, medicine in general. So today I'm going to talk about uh, what I would probably say is an area that doesn't get as much attention um, as other areas of mass spectrometry, and that's inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. There's a good chance that uh, having ICPMS in the title may have already whittled down the number of people who are going to attend uh, to only those who actually use ICPMS. Um, and I think that's really what we're trying to push against with a seminar like this, is to talk about some of the other ways in which we can actually use this technology um, to be able to do things that other types of mass spectrometry, uh, specifically time of flight or triple quadrupole technology, um, typically get thought of immediately uh, and nobody really sort of uh, makes their way to ICPMS. Very powerful technology, uh, very interesting technology, something I've uh, been fortunate to spend a lot of time using. And so that's really what we're going to focus on here today. I'm going to try to monitor the question section to make sure if by chance at any point I've, I'm speaking of something, I don't know the degree of expertise in the audience. Um, and so if there's anything that you want to ask during, um, I will try to monitor so we can try to answer those in real time. Uh, if not, I certainly will try to get to it at the end. Um, or if there isn't time, uh, then certainly um, all of you can contact me, which I have my contact information here. Um, it's a good chance that I, I know some of you who are in attendance. Um, and obviously prior to this I was at uh, AREP and the University of Utah, so this is my updated contact information. Uh, you don't have to think I'm ignoring you if you're sending me messages to my other email. It's just not working anymore. Uh, so this is my current contact information, uh, now part of NMS Laboratories. Um, but the uh, work that I'll be presenting today um, was done entirely while I was at AREP and the University of Utah. So speaker financial disclosures, I think it's important just to say that uh, I did have Agilent equipment for R&D uh, while I was at ARUP. Uh, and in fact, Agilent had a, a, was very helpful uh, in trying to use some of their technology in ways 
um, that a, they themselves had not typically always thought about uh, using it. And so I think that's very interesting um, to get support from a vendor. Lots of other uh, vendors are helpful as well, so I don't want this to be uh, overly, uh, overly skewed in one direction. I will show a lot of pictures of Agilent equipment. I figure it's the least I can do for them sponsoring this event. Uh, they've been uh, very supportive of this project specifically. So acknowledgments. I don't typically spend time go through one uh, line by line for acknowledgments, but I am going to pause here just a little bit to highlight uh, some extremely helpful people. Um, this was a project that I actually took on myself. I did uh, all of the bench work um, that had a huge amount of support from quite a few people, uh, both at AREP as well as Agilent. Um, and a lot of that support came uh, right when I was transitioning out of AREP and the University of Utah. Uh, they really helped. Busy time as always in the laboratory, um, but they, they really went above and beyond trying to make sure that I could make as much, uh, I could get as much out of my uh, last few days. Uh, this was about the last month of my time there. Um, so not a complete project, but I think still shows and illustrates some, uh, some really interesting applications uh, of ICPMS technology. Christian Law is a trace element supervisor uh, at AREP, uh, extremely helpful, uh, never, uh, never too worried when he saw me actually in the laboratory with gloves on, uh, but very supportive, very helpful. Dr. Julie Ray is an R&D scientist at AREP. Uh, she is uh, officially, unofficially the queen of thyroid hormone at AREP, whether she wants to be or not. Uh, so I'll be presenting some work from her. Terry Bayo is one of the bioanalytical engineers at AREP, uh, a go-to guy for not only applications but really instrumentation, uh, extremely helpful, um, very, uh, very reliable, very willing to help me in the last few months uh, with some very uh, new technology and applications. And then certainly everybody in that laboratory I mentioned, the Trace and Toxic Elements Laboratory uh, at AREP, uh, and then the AREP Institute who provided the funding for the work. And then Agilent, uh, Mark Linsky and Carrie Adler. Uh, Mark helped with an enormous amount of the LC setup, which you'll see is really one of the keys to making a project like this succeed. Uh, Carrie was a scientist who worked at AREP, uh, made me look good while I was there. Uh, she's now uh, happily doing the same thing for Agilent. Uh, so uh, good to see uh, 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 where everybody ends up, and uh, thanks to everybody who has participated in this. So the learning objectives for today, pretty straightforward. So we're going to discuss the basics of LCICPMS, and we're going to look at some similarities and differences to other types of mass spec. Um, I have some uh, highly technical drawings that I've done myself that you'll be able to see. Uh, they're short little videos to try to highlight some of the differences between these. Um, at the same time, we're going to compare and contrast workflows for thyroid hormones by LCICPMS, uh, as well as LC tandem mass spec. Um, so as you'll notice, we're talking about liquid chromatography as the separation science, uh, and then it's really about changing the detector. Um, that's really what the, the crux of this discussion is really going to be about today. And then lastly, um, we're going to look at and see how does LCICPMS uh, work for thyroid hormones. And what we're really targeting here is the measurement of thyroid hormones in serum. A lot of past work uh, that has been published has uh, largely been done in urine looking at thyroid hormone and, analog and analogs. Um, but this was really sort of a focus on serum uh, and a focus on, you know, could we actually use LCICPMS? Why would we think about that? And that's really sort of uh, some of the key aspects to the day is what would have led us to think about using LCICPMS as a technology. So we'll talk very briefly about clinical and research utility of RT3. And in truth, I'm not going to belabor this too much. Um, and you'll see why uh, in regards to how a project like this sometimes presents itself I'd love to say that sometimes, you know, that all the time projects come out of great ideas, uh, you know, great collaborations, uh, but sometimes they just come out of need uh, and we have to do something to solve a problem um, and we turn to whatever technology we might actually have. And one of the things that I think is very important, uh, no matter what type of technology you use, is to understand the limitations but also the advantages of the different types of technology that we have available and to make sure that we really apply uh, and use them uh, and play to the strengths of the different technology. As I talked about, a uh, little tongue-in-cheek, we have some highly technical drawings that you'll get to see to try to help explain some of the basic principles across these different type of technologies. Uh, and then some early performance characteristics. And so this is very early data. I didn't want to focus really on the method validation. I would imagine a large portion of the audience understands what it takes to validate a method. It wouldn't really be all that different to validate a method by ICPMS versus triple quadruple, you know, certainly some subtleties there, of course, 
Uh, but for the most part, you know, what I really wanted to focus on is, you know, why would we pick this type of technology? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? Um, and then focus a little bit on the front end, uh, meaning the LC portion, uh, to look at higher throughput testing uh, when we might have some limitations that we're trying to oversee. So here's the analytical vignette. So not the clinical vignette, but the analytical vignette. And you'll kind of see what I mean in regards to not always having um, a great research project uh, to start out with whenever we're looking for uh, uh, an application of technology. So a very uh, common scenario is that you have send out costs for reverse thyroid hormone or RT3. They've been on the rise for the past six months and just about every organization uh, is monitoring their send out costs uh, as a way to try to contain uh, any kind of cost. So certainly a test that's on the rise, you could argue about the clinical utility, you could argue about the research utility, uh, but you can't really argue about the costs associated with the test going out the door. So we'll imagine that there's an R&D oversight group in this organization and they've asked you to determine the cost associated with developing the test, including the resources you'd need and the equipment required. Um, so very, very typical situation. Uh, and so now we think, okay, well, what do we know, right? It's obviously an analyte we haven't measured before. We're going to make the assumption that there's mass spectrometry in this building at all, as, as uh, already. Um, but like a lot of groups, uh, it's possible that we have expertise in pain management, so urine toxicology, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, so RT3 is a bit of a different animal, um, and so that's going to come into play as well. And then we'll imagine that we remember a talk a few years back. Uh, MSACL is a really great clinical conference uh, for mass spectrometry. Um, and I'm giving them a little bit of recognition because they, in the past years, have had an ICPMS track, which I think is fantastic, really highlighting some of the novel applications of ICPMS. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Dr. Julie Ray, who I did introduce in my uh, thank you, she did present an MSACL about using LC tandem mass spectrometry and some problems that were encountered uh, at AUP when the volumes increased at this organization. Um, so like many, we've developed tests in the past, uh, they're developed with an expectation of a, of a certain volume. When that volume grows, we oftentimes find things that we didn't anticipate uh, depending upon the degree of robustness and really just what you can anticipate uh, when volumes change. So the big catch here is we've been to a conference, we heard a scientist talk about challenges with LC triple quad mass spec, which is a red flag, right? We want to kind of consider, well, maybe, maybe there's something that we need to be worried about there. And then the big catch is we only have enough funds to buy a single instrument, which again is not too big of, a, uh, of an unusual circumstance. So we're not going to be able to bring up uh, backup instruments, right? We're not going to be able to do the very normal laboratory medicine philosophy of buying two of everything to make sure we have a backup. So we need to make sure that we get the right technology. Turnaround time is important, but what I'm talking about here is not necessarily turnaround time in regards to being able to push a result out quickly but it's really how much downtime can we actually handle if our instrument goes down. And that goes back to you know, us pretending that we're remembering this discussion at MSACL about instrument downtime. Uh, and so turnaround time when everything's operating the way it should be is one thing. Turnaround time when instruments are down, obviously very different situation. Uh, and then funneling into both of those is robustness, right? We really need to make sure that we pick a solution that's not going to have an em enormous amounts of downtime, not going to be very finicky. Um, and so those are sort of the, the three kind of main criteria uh, that come up in my mind every time I sort of approach uh, a project, uh, amongst other things as well, of course. So we're going to go back and we're going to dig through our notes and we're going to find the information that we saw presented uh, at that MSACL conference by Julie Ray. So the project with RT3 by LC triple quad. Um, so the basics of this is it was a 96 well plate assay, which is good. We're looking at high throughput. We don't want to have individual tubes. Um, so that fits the criteria for what we're looking for. But one thing to kind of keep in mind is, you know, that in itself is pretty unique um, with uh, different types of mass spectrometry. Uh, so really, you know, volume is important, right? We don't want to develop a method in tubes if we very well know we're going to have to go to plates pretty quickly. And anybody that has developed methods uh, in plates or transitioned them from tubes to plates can tell you the manufacturer of plates. There's lots of things that go into uh, the overall quality and success of the assays. We had a five and a half minute injection to injection, which again, you can very quickly sit down. You can figure out the math of what your throughput and what your capacity is going to be with a five and a half minute injection to injection. Will we even be able to 
sustain the volume that we actually have, how quickly will we actually overcome with the capacity that we have, you know, all very straightforward things to do when methods are published in the literature and presented at conferences. The one issue here that we'll uh, remember and we'll come back to uh, is that RT3 and T3 have to be chromatographically separated. Um, and we'll dig into um, some superficial details at least between the different methods and you'll kind of see what some of this terminology means if this is uh, one of the first times you've come across it. But RT3 and T3 have identical mass to charge ratios. So the mass spec really is not going to be able to tell them apart very easily. If we think about tandem mass spectrometry, well, they're going to have the same fragments. So again, we're not going to be able to tell them apart. So chromatographic retention time is the way that we're going to be able to tell these compounds separately. So I think that's important to note because we typically think uh, oftentimes tandem mass spectrometry has great specificity, while as a single quadrupole it doesn't have the same degree of specificity, it's very contextually dependent. And so uh, important concept to kind of keep in mind there. However, the advantage, of course, to the LC triple quad mass spec test is that it's commonly used. So it's great to have users that you can contact, great to have other people who've used it. Um, sometimes it's fun to be the innovator, uh, but probably not if it's your job every day to run the test and it doesn't really feel very fun to be an innovator, I'm sure. So the bad thing that we do remember from this is the instrument fouling. So that was one of the big uh, findings and one of the big issues uh, that was being presented. There was a constant downtime for cleaning, so that makes us a bit concerned because, again, we've got to have a robust assay. We don't have a whole lot of... Uh, um, uh, we don't have a, a whole lot of time for instrument downtime and we're not going to have backup instruments, so that's something to be uh, very mindful of. Um, and uh, you probably remember the costs associated with maintenance, right? It's not free to take an instrument down, it's not free to actually clean it. Um, so not only do you actually have lost opportunity costs with being able to push volume through the lab, but you've got the maintenance costs on top of that. And so some of the data that was actually presented at that time um, that you can see here, so uh, Matt Beattie and Terry Veo were both helpful in getting this, is, uh, and I was involved in this uh, sort of initial troubleshooting, is we took some of the washing. So the, big, the, the uh, big issue here is they were taking the front end apart and having to clean it um, pretty far back into the instrument as well. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to see what is all over the instrument, right? You could kind of see like a white coating in different places. It was really causing the sensitivity to bottom out. Um, and so fun with instruments, we can actually take that and I feel like everything eventually finds its way into an ICPMS to determine what it might actually be. And so we did this, we looked to see what it was and not surprisingly, uh, we found quite a bit of iodine. Um, I have sort of iodine being called out here with a little box because typically you don't see big iodine peaks like this unless you've enriched for iodine. Um, and so that's something to kind of keep note here. This is a semi-quant scan done in helium mode uh, on an Agilent 7900 and what you're really sort of appreciating here is there's quite a bit of iodine. Now, that's not that surprising because we have a method that's enriching for thyroid hormone which is iodine containing so we might expect there to be a lot of iodine. Um, but at the same time there's not much we can do about that because we have a method that's enriching for thyroid hormone and it, that's exactly what it needs to do. So this isn't necessarily a problem that we could address by having pure solvents or you know, switching to a different uh, extraction method because ultimately we're going to be pulling potentially the same things that are causing us issues. So was this the major reason for downtime? We don't know, but ultimately what we know is here's what the elemental signature was of essentially the junk that was on the instrument. We see a lot of iodine, so we knew we needed to do something about this. So to Julie's credit, you'll have seen her uh, present this in regards to what were the efforts to actually try to uh, address all of this instrument fouling. So we have new column chemistry that was looked at to address retention time shifting so that potentially we could divert away some of the T4 to waste. Um, and we'll come back to that concept a little bit in regards to what compounds are we actually looking at, when are they coming off the column, and what does that actually mean uh, for things that can go into the mass spec versus things that we could potentially divert to waste. Uh, looked at alternative uh, solid phase extraction stationary phases to try to increase sample cleanup. But again, we can increase sample cleanup uh, certainly, but we can't ever reduce the fact that we are uh, pulling iodine or iodine containing compounds out because that's exactly what we're trying to do. So because we had a pretty good suspicion that it was the iodine that was causing the problem, there's very little that we felt that ultimately we'd be able to do by trying to change uh, the sample cleanup. But we looked at a lot of different types of anion exchange, different types of solid phase extraction, getting rid of, getting rid of phospholipids, which is always an interesting experiment to, to try and to look at uh, phospholipid, phospholipid transitions after uh, with and without phospholipid removal plates. 
Uh, but we tried a lot of different things, uh, uh, and ultimately what we found out was spent lots of time, put lots of effort into this, but we didn't solve the problem. Now, to Julie's credit, and I think something that's very interesting for everybody to think about is, you know, this was a project that ended up uh, with no solution for what it was intended to do. Uh, but if any of you actually get, got to see this presentation at MSATL, Julie was able to combine this with a really interesting study about traumatic brain injury and RT3 at the same time. So, you know, out of the ashes of a failed project, oftentimes there's still something very interesting. And more importantly, what I think is great a lot about a lot of the Mass Spec conferences is, you know, we're pretending we are at this conference, we saw this discussion, this is helping us to inform. So presenting failures is oftentimes more interesting, I think, than presenting a lot of the successes that you typically see. So we've got sort of the analytical vignette, right? We've got sort of pressure to develop an assay. We've got concerns because we've seen some issues with our go-to technology, if you want to call it that. Um, and so we're going to dive into some of the details here in regards to, you know, what are we actually looking for, what technology is out there, uh, in which direction do we ultimately want to go. I said I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on the clinical and the research background for RT3 because, again, if you look at that analytical vignette, send-outs are climbing. You know, there's room to be, or there's arguments to be made on both sides in regards to whether or not RT3 should be measured, how is it actually used. But ultimately, again, we're looking at a financial and a business decision of, you know, we need to develop this test. So for that reason, we need to understand just a little bit about these molecules themselves. So T4, largely considered the uh, inactive or a pro-hormone, gives rise to T3. There's, com there's enzymes called diiodinases that will actually, uh, as you can see here, um, take off sort of an outer ring iodine uh, generating T3. However, at the same time, T4 could also go through a different deiodinase path to uh, deiodinate on an inner ring, generating reverse T3 or RT3. And so it's typically thought that you know, T4 has very little activity. T3 is really sort of the main uh, actuator of the hormone uh, system. And then RT3 is considered to be inactive as well. And that's where I think some of the contention comes into play in regards to you know, is RT3, does RT3 actually have a uh, function on its own? Does it not? Is it valuable to measure? Um, very interesting research, I think, in regards to brain injury with thyroid hormone metabolism, uh, but outside the scope of what we're talking about today. Ultimately, what you can take away from this is we've got three major uh, molecules that we need to worry about in our assay. T3 and RT3 have the exact same mass, even though they have iodines removed from different parts of their uh, outer ring structures. T4, different mass. Uh, so when we're looking at different types of technology, you know, having the same mass, having different masses uh, will certainly come into play. So before we actually get to what kind of detector are we going to use, we need to think a little bit about the front end speed. Um, this is something that I don't think uh, is oftentimes as well appreciated um, in the idea of smaller, uh, lower volume laboratories. Uh, typically we think of multiplexing or in this situation what I'll talk about uh, more is column regeneration strategies. We may think of those as you know, something that large reference laboratories deal with. Um, but in truth, what we're really thinking about is capacity. How do we get more capacity out of an instrument that we have? And odds are, as soon as you buy your first instrument, you're going to very quickly exceed the capacity, either because your clinical volume grows or possibly because you now need this instrument for R&D work um, that's being consumed by clinical work. So getting samples through quickly is not necessarily just a large laboratory problem. It's a problem that everybody needs to think about. Um, and there's some very interesting strategies out there. And so here I'm showing some of the basic tools that we're going to be talking about today. So chromatographic columns in the top or, uh, uh, upper left. The key to this is we're going to have two, uh, two columns, identical columns, but we're going to have two columns. Uh, we have an isocratic pump in the mix here. Um, we also have uh, a multi-sampler, so somewhere where we can sort of stack samples and uh, kind of leave. At the same time, we have the ability to do overlapped injection, and we'll come back to some of these concepts so you can appreciate sort of how they fit into this entire piece. Binary and quaternary pumps, we have uh, 10 port valves. So lots of plumbing involved, obviously, in what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but extremely important to kind of see what we can do uh, with a front end. And again, don't think that this is really just a high volume issue. You know, what we're really looking at is throughput and capacity, which is something that everybody needs to be concerned about, um, regardless of what your sort of total volume really kind of is. We all want to get better capacity out of the instrumentation that we actually purchase. So here you can kind of get an idea of if we have two different pump systems, what can we actually do with this? And so. 
Uh, if we look at sort of the top situation here, um, we have, uh, and whenever the system is in position one, uh, we have an eluent pump that is going to be driving through the auto sampler and in tandem with the auto sampler. We're going into position two, which will then come position three. So most of you, I'm sure, can appreciate sort of the nuances with a uh, two position valve. And so it's either going to have one and ten connected, uh, which obviously then makes two and three connected, or it's going to have one and two connected. Uh, so in this sort of position one, we'll call this, uh, we're going into two, out three, we're going to be going across one of the columns, so in this situation it's column one, into six, out seven, to the detector. So position one, essentially what we have here is a very normal LC setup. We're going to potentially be running through a gradient if we have a binary pump set up. Very normal sort of situation, pump driving across the column into the detector. However, at the same time, uh, you uh, can hopefully also appreciate that we have a, another pump in the mix here as well. Uh, we have a regeneration pump. Now this regeneration pump is going to be running independent of the eluent pump. The regeneration pump is going to be going into 4, out 5, uh, into 10, out 1, going across the second column that we have in this system, in 8, out 9, into waste. So essentially we now have a separate pump system that's driving through a different sort of set of positions in the valve into waste. And so hopefully what you can kind of appreciate now is we have with these two different pump systems, we're able to actually do very normal, typical chromatography that we're kind of used to. But at the same time, we have this separate pump system that's able to be running on a separate column going into waste. So for any of you who have had a lot of experience uh, with LC or have done some LC, you can probably start to appreciate where this is going in regards to efficiencies and where the dead parts are in a typical sort of LC uh, chromatogram and how a second pump could actually come into play. But before we move on to that, then we have the idea, of course, is now we have a second position. So we had position one, now position two, everything is just reversed, right? We have our LU1 pump going through the auto sampler, two to one, now going across column two um, and then to the detector. Our regeneration pump instead is now pushing mobile phase across column one. So it's just a complete switch, right? In position one, we were running across column one. In position two, we're running across column two. Um, so we've got sort of that two pump system running and we're able to potentially cut down the LC time. And that's what we're going to look at now in regards to how does this actually help us to have these two positions. So here's a bit of a description of column regeneration in action. So this isn't true multiplexing, but this is an interesting strategy in many different situations uh, especially something like urine toxicology or even serum toxicology testing where you have lots of peaks, you have lots of compounds you're looking at. Multiplexing doesn't always work. Uh, sometimes there's not a lot of dead time in the chromatogram. But that's where column regeneration can still have a huge impact on the total throughput. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of take some, uh, a look at some of those details as well. But remember, one of the big reasons we're looking at this is not because we're a massive volume laboratory. It's because we've only got one potential purchase here for an instrument. So we're going to have to make the most out of this instrument and we're going to have to be mindful of the fact that once we put our clinical volume on there, we're going to have to have some bandwidth for maintenance. We're going to have to have some potential bandwidth for uh, R&D work if we want to do more work on it. So worrying about capacity is always something that we should think about uh, sooner rather than later. So in this column regeneration strategy then, we have two different column systems. We're going to imagine that our starting conditions are going to be 70% A and 30% B. So column one, we're going to be at starting condition 70-30 with the what we'll call analytical pumps. Column two, however, is going to be at the same starting condition, but it's going to be run off of the separate, separate set of pumps or the so-called regeneration pumps. So we've got same mobile phase composition running across two pumps, uh, running from two pumps across two independent columns right now. So that's what you can sort of imagine as a starting point. So the analytical pump system is going to run through the gradient. So in this case, it'll start from 70% A and we'll go all the way down to 5% A. So 95% B is what we're going to end up with. So the analytical pump will run the LC gradient like you would expect, start to final. Um, and then I put a little plus there because we'll take a look and see when we do this column regeneration strategy, we have to have a, a, a short little wash step um, at the end uh, to make sure that the mobile phase lines are actually at the right composition. And then separately of that, we have a regeneration pump that's set to final conditions, which will then flip to starting conditions. So now you're starting to hopefully appreciate this idea behind the analytical pump running from starting conditions through the end of the gradient, 
and then we have a separate regeneration pump that's going to be able to run from ending conditions and get us back to start. So a typical idea is we're going to inject onto column one, we're going to run through that gradient. Column one is going to reach its final condition like normal. We're going to shortly, or we're going to do a, a really quick switch to starting conditions to essentially flush out all of the mobile phase lines. And then we're going to have our valve that's going to switch to the next position. And now in that situation, column one is going to now be in line with the regeneration pump, which is at final conditions. So we're going to start cleaning off uh, column one. Column two is now going to be driven by the analytical pump, which is going to run again through the next gradient. Um, so we'll take a little bit of a, a closer look at this uh, in regards to um, what, type of, uh, what type of gradient positions that we're actually going to have. And again, this entire sort of uh, everything I'll show here, a lot of stuff was done initially in pure solvents. At this point, it's mostly been serum. Um, one of the questions was what type of uh, materials have we actually used? Uh, and so uh, serum was what this test was really designed for. But in truth, that's one of the advantages, I think, of the ICPMS that we'll take a look at, is we need to be worried about the LC system, the cleanliness of the LC system, but we don't have to worry as much about the robustness of the mass spec system, uh, and we'll hopefully kind of cover that when we look at some of the different technologies. <clears throat> so here's a cartoon to kind of give you an idea of, well, how does this alternating column regeneration strategy really help to increase throughput and increase capacity? So if we look at the very top line here, so this is very normal sort of uh, effort, right, sequential runs. So we're all familiar with the idea here. I'm trying to get my pointer to come up. Here we go. So sequential runs, we have our draw and inject cycle, which can sometimes be anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute, depending upon what we're doing. We have our gradient. We have our column wash, equilibration, and then we're ready to go again, right? So this would be five and a half minutes injection to injection where we're ready to do another injection cycle. So now if we compare this uh, to using an isocratic regeneration pump, um, we can't run a gradient on that isocratic system, but we can run sort of one composition of mobile phase. And so now what we can do is we can take this uh, uh, column equilibration step and we can run it in parallel when it makes sense to do this. So now we have our draw and inject cycle, our gradient run, our column wash, we have this little rinse step that's now involved uh, so that way we can uh, clean out the mobile phase lines. But then rather than having to wait for the equilibration to occur, um, we can go straight back to direct injection or uh, draw and inject into the gradient because we're going to switch the valve and we're going to use that second pump system to do the equilibration. So here's where you can see a little bit of time savings already is we can have one column in line with the analytical pump running the gradient. As soon as it's done, we can switch over, let a separate uh, pump system run the equilibration, and we can get right back to doing analytical uh, gradient on the freshly equilibrated pump. So that's great. That's a time savings for sure. Um, and some of the figures here, you know, they may or may not apply depending upon what your gradient actually is, the speed, but it's a good example overall. So now if we were to take that isocratic regeneration pump, and turn it into a gradient pump. Okay, now what else could we do? We can take this wash step and we can actually move this wash step to the separate pump system and we no longer have to have that wash system part of that linear um, process that we have for the analytical pump. So now we have our draw inject gradient run, we have that small rinse cycle that we had to impose and then we're right back to going to draw and inject because now we can switch the valve and we can have the regeneration pump run both the wash and the equilibration step. So now you're starting to see a little bit of how these pumps are going to be running parallel to one another to uh, ultimately save time. And then lastly, sort of a newer feature, right, continuing to increase our throughput, we can now look at, well, what if we could do so-called overlapped injection, where rather than the auto sampler sitting there and waiting for the gradient to finish, what if we could tell the auto sampler to go ahead and get started and that way we don't have to wait for that 30 seconds to a minute uh, for the inject cycle to occur. So now as you can kind of see, not only are we using two separate pumps, but now we're also using uh, a higher end auto sampler to be able to do overlapped injection. We can really start increasing our capacity. What's interesting is we haven't had to make any compromises to the gradient. We didn't have to make any compromises to the equilibration, to the washing. So we can take care of our LC system and our uh, columns the same that we would want to, but we're able to run these processes in parallel uh, so that we can actually just reduce the time that we're spending and waiting for one step to finish to move on to another. 
And so here's where you can hopefully kind of appreciate that, you know, this is not really true multiplexing, but this really does have uh, uh, considerable throughput in regards to the time that we can save, you know, with this giving an indication of about 60% of the total time uh, with this alternate strategy, you're getting very, very close to being able to actually double your capacity on a single instrument. That's a very attractive proposition, even in a laboratory that's not super high volume, right? Again, we want to try to be as efficient as possible in the different testing that we actually do. So hopefully that was a, a decent overview of the LC system. It's a huge component to this because we have to remember that initial constraint, which is we're not really going to be able to, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to um, uh, worry about having a secondary system. You know, we're not going to be able to worry about um, having a lot of downtime, right? We want to have a robust method, gives us good turnaround time. Um, but capacity and throughput is something we really can spend some time on the LC system. And now, whether we pick a triple quad, whether we pick an ICPMS, whether we actually pick a QTOF, uh, whatever you want to potentially use, um, now we've got as efficient as possible as a front end, so we can really make sure that we're as efficient as possible on the back end. But we're still not out of the water, right? Because that initial analytical problem told us that we need to be very careful about the different technology that we pick. So now to be able to kind of give you a little bit of an understanding, uh, very quick background, I don't want to belabor how each one of these technologies works because I doubt anybody signed up for this webinar to understand the details of mass spectrometry. But I imagine there are some of you um, that maybe have not had as much experience um, and I want to be able to show off my amazing drawing talent. And so for that reason, we'll kind of uh, systematically go through here and look at the different technologies. Um, and we'll think of this in terms of we're trying to decide what technology do we want to use. And so we're going to start with tandem mass spectrometry uh, and take a look at you know, what makes tandem mass spectrometry unique uh, and what really makes it sort of a powerful technology. The first requirement with any type of mass spectrometry is getting ions in the gas phase, and most often we see electrospray ionization being used. This complex process can be understood for small molecules by imagining small droplets forming from the liquid flow off the chromatographic cone. It is through a combination of heat and high voltage that highly charged droplets are generated. If you look closer at the droplets, we can see the process of Coulomb fission generating successively smaller droplets until ion evaporation occurs and we are left with ions in the gas phase and our mass spectrometer can finally get to work. It is important to note that the mass spectrometer will see ions as mass divided by the charge. For most small molecules, a single charge is present, so the mass over charge ratio is equal to the mass, but this isn't always a case where multiple charges are present. After being guided into the high vacuum of the mass spectrometer, the ions will encounter the first quadrupole and undergo a mass filtering event based on flight stabilization. A combination of voltages produces oscillating electric fields that will select for a narrow window of masses. Although a single quadrupole provides specificity, the use of tandem mass spectrometry further enhances the specificity. The process of collision-induced dissociation occurs after the first mass filtering event has completed. An inert gas fills the collision cell and the filtered ions collide and reproducible fragments are generated. Based on the energy supplied to the collision cell, we can change the ratio of fragments that are generated, giving us an important characteristic in molecule identification. After dissociation, the second mass filtering event occurs through a similar flight stabilization process noted earlier. The combinations of voltages produces an oscillating electric field, and we are able to select fragments to eventually be registered at the detector. This combination of mass filtering, fragmentation, and secondary mass filtering provides the overall specificity of tandem mass spectrometry. Not only does a molecule need the right mass, it also needs to generate the right fragments in the right ratios for a positive identification. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview uh, in regards to uh, tandem mass spectrometry. Um, hopefully you didn't learn anything uh, too deep there, uh, but just kind of a nice sort of cartoon illustration of uh, what makes tandem mass spectrometry really that unique. Um, but the odds are, if we're in this laboratory that we're pretending we're doing this sort of RT3 thought experiment, you know, we probably have some expertise with tandem mass spec. We appreciate the idea of transitions. But as I kind of mentioned earlier, we're still going to have to worry about chromatographic separation. Uh, so if we're going to be trying to push throughput uh, and get a lot of uh, capacity out of our instrument, we're not going to be able to have a whole lot of uh, play with that um, 
with the chromatography time because we're going to have to make sure that the compounds stay separated. So a technology that a lot of people I'm sure have heard about, um, there's already CPT codes associated with time of flight mass spec, uh, and it's certainly growing in popularity, although I think it's probably still not quite uh, ready to find a home uh, in the majority of laboratories, but a very interesting technology for lots of different reasons. So we'll take a look now about time of flight mass spec, uh, technology that most likely many of you don't have as much expertise with, uh, but at the same time, uh, something that's out there. We do want to take a look at this because, again, the whole point of, of really kind of having a, a discussion like this is, you know, did we do our due diligence to understand what might we actually get using one type of technology versus another type of technology. We won't go over ion formation again, but it is important to note that gas phase ions are key to being able to separate molecules using any type of mass spectrometry. For time of flight mass spec, instead of filtering ions with a combination of voltages, we instead line up a discrete packet of ions and give them all an equal push into the flight tube with a pulsar. By giving all the ions the same push, lighter ions will go faster in comparison to larger ions. We push them all in the same direction towards the high vacuum flight tube where they will start their journey towards the detector. To enhance the ability of the time of flight instrument to tell the difference between molecules with a similar mass, we can use a reflectron. This serves to reduce the spread of energies that similar ions might have so that ions of the same mass hit the detector at the same time. Without a reflectron, the mass spectrometer could misidentify the same compounds as having different masses based on different arrival times at the detector. At this point, we wait for ions of different masses to arrive at the detector with light ions arriving first, followed by successively heavier ions. Time of flight has a major advantage over tandem mass spectrometry in that ions of an entire mass range of interest are allowed to eventually reach the detector. This gives us high ion transmission that can be helpful when we are measuring lots of ions in short periods of time. Okay, so that's time of flight mass spectrometry. So hopefully we're gaining a little bit of an appreciation for uh, ion transmission. Uh, that's really, I think, one of the major differences between triple quad and time of flight. Uh, for a triple quad at any given time, we're going to have to be looking at a specific mass. Uh, and with tandem mass spectrometry, we're going to be looking at a specific uh, mass to charge uh, transition to another mass to charge or a fragment. Um, so the overall throughput of the different ions we're looking at, we're going to be a bit limited. To be fair, modern mass spectrometers, quadruple mass spectrometers, they cycle very fast. Um, but there is going to be a limitation depending upon how complex the analysis is that we're doing. Time of flight has some huge advantages in that aspect then uh, in regards to very fast chromatography or lots of different compounds wanting to be looked at at any given time. Uh, but certainly single stage time of flight mass spectrometry has its limitations. Even though you might hear it called high resolution mass spec, you'd be surprised if you haven't used it before how many compounds have the exact same accurate mass. <laughs> so uh, it's definitely something where you need to be worried about specificity. Um, if it's being used in a definitive way, um, you need to make sure certainly that you understand all the limitations there. So we've got the idea of triple quadruple mass spec, which I'm guessing most people are pretty comfortable with. Uh, we move on to time of flight mass spec, which uh, I would say at this point, if I was in the uh, position of this individual trying to decide, doesn't seem like it quite fits. Um, we're not really doing huge numbers of compounds. Uh, we're not really doing presumptive testing or any kind of screening. Uh, so triple quadrupole still seems to be sort of the uh, front runner. Of course, the problem is the reason that we're thinking about a different technology is because of what we've heard uh, sort of through the grapevine and presented at conferences in regards to what's actually kind of potentially going to be a problem for us uh, using a triple quadrupole technology. So ICPMS, it may be something that a lot of you have expertise with. It may be some, uh, something that some of you do not have expertise with. So we're going to take a look, uh, a look at uh, ICPMS now uh, before we finish up and take a look at how the RT3 by LC ICPMS method actually worked. Inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry is the same as what we discussed with tandem mass spectrometry except with a different ion source, and most often with only a single quadrupole used. Gas phase ions are still needed, and the first step for ICPMS is to separate small droplets from large by using a spray chamber. This ensures only the smallest droplets move on in the process. The small droplets are vaporized, atomized, and then ionized in the inductively coupled plasma ion source. The torch has a gas supplied, such as argon, 
an initial spark of energy causes electrons to be liberated. The magnetic field that results from the oscillating voltages in the torch coils accelerates the electrons and sustains a plasma at an energy capable of ionizing most atoms that enter. It is important to note that in ICPMS, the ion source is very harsh, so even though whole molecules go in one side, only ionized elements come out the other. The structure of compounds is lost, which is an important concept to remember for later. Once we have gas phase ions, we eventually encounter the mass filtering quadruple as before, where we select specific ions to reach the detector using combinations of voltages and flight stabilization in the oscillating electric fields. Though single quadrupoles are most common, tandem mass spectrometers are available with inductively coupled plasmas as the ion source. Okay, so we've had our kind of quick view of the different technologies, uh, what they have to offer, uh, some of the strengths, maybe some of the weaknesses kind of jumped out to some of you who've either used one or maybe used all of them. I think the important thing to think about here is an ICPMS, it's just a different ion source, um, but it's a quadrupole. Um, it's unique in the sense that it typically only does positive mode, so we don't do negative mode analyses with it, which can actually reduce the cost, which is a bit of an attractive component to it. Uh, slightly different plumbing, slightly different gases that you actually have to have. Uh, but in this scenario, we're thinking about thyroid hormone analysis. Uh, we don't necessarily need to worry about being inside of a clean room, uh, worrying about any of those kinds of aspects that we might think about if we're using an ITPMS for trace element analysis uh, uh, when those regulations type of a, uh, kind of apply. So for that reason, it's a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting technology because of the robustness. If you think back to the beginning, uh, of that clinical vignette, uh, we talked about needing robustness, right? That was sort of the important point. We're only going to have one instrument. We're going to have to have high throughput if we want to be able to utilize the instrument fully. Um, but we need something that's going to be able to handle uh, everything that we can essentially throw at it. You can probably appreciate that the ion source doesn't get much harsher than a plasma, um, which is obviously uh, close to surface of the sun kind of temperature. But now there's a limitation that we talked about there and hopefully you could appreciate is that um, when we look at what we're measuring, we're me measuring independent elements, we're not measuring structures. So we don't have transitions like we do in triple quadrupole mass spec. Um, and so initially you may think, well, that's a limitation. We need to be able to look at structures in order to use a uh, mass spectrometer uh, to be able to measure thyroid hormones uh, specifically. But again, if you think back to a triple quadrupole mass spec, it can't tell the difference between T3 and RT3 either. They have to be chromatographically separated. So it's the same situation where we have with an LC-ICPMS. We're going to be looking at iodine, and we're going to need to know which species it comes from. So it's going to be connected to uh, the LC method that we're actually looking at. So putting all these pieces together then, uh, we've got the LC system that we um, can configure for higher throughput independent of uh, what type of detector or mass spectrometer we're actually going to be using. But in this case, we're going to be looking at using an ICPMS. And I want to highlight the fact that this is not a new concept to measure thyroid hormones by ICPMS, um, but it's certainly not something that has found its way into sort of uh, routine clinical use. And I think primarily just because of the comfort level that a lot of people have with uh, LC triple quadruple mass spectrometry. And sometimes, uh, often, some of the published literature has been done in urine. Here, we're obviously primarily worried about serum. Uh, and the sensitivities in the past have not always been where they needed to be. So there are some limitations. This is not going to be a perfect out-of-the-box solution, uh, but it's certainly something that is of interest. And now, one of the reasons why, at, uh, at the time at AREP, we were the most interested in exploring uh, ICPMS as a potential uh, possibility is we had ICPMS in-house, so that's a huge uh, reduction in risk. <laughs> we don't have to make an investment in a technology uh, that we're not already comfortable with and don't already understand sort of the strengths and weaknesses that it actually has. The other aspect I mentioned earlier that's also very important uh, is we did have, uh, we had already converted a lot of our technology over to 96-well-based testing. Now that's a pretty unique concept for anybody who spent time in a clinical uh, ICPMS sort of laboratory 96 well plates are not typically what you would normally see. Um, so for that reason, for a laboratory to go from you know, potentially you know, 15 mil tubes to a 96 well plate, that in itself can be a bit of a dramatic shift. But as I mentioned, we had already kind of made this shift. We'd been using the uh, CTAC MVX 7100, so low volume auto sampler, uh, integrated nicely uh, with the Agilent technology that we actually had. And we already had iodine serum and urine assays running. And if you think about it, the typical prep for ICPMS testing is a dilute and shoot method. Um, and we never had any problems with the ICPMS running iodine. 
Um, and so for that reason, we thought, well, this is a very robust technology. It's already running the matrix that we're looking at. Uh, so maybe this is something that we could actually explore, knowing that we could actually resolve the compounds chromatographically prior to uh, putting them into the ICPMS. So one of the major advantages and one of the uh, applications that's out there that I think has really kind of made this a reality um, to look into uh, is the use of an organics torch. And I'm not going to go into too many of the details with that, but it's essentially a bit of a smaller uh, overall orifice on the sample injector, so it reduces the amount of solvent going into the plasma. And at the same time, we're able to tee in an oxygen gas to be able to help the combustion of the solvents that we're putting in. And typically for ICPMS, you know, high solvents, high organic solvents are not what you would expect uh, could be easily tolerated uh, for ICPMS. Uh, but with some advances in the last few years or so, uh, that's definitely not the case anymore. So the interesting thing here is we already had a method running. Uh, you could consider this a method that you found in the literature. We actually had a method at AREP that we were already running. And so the idea about being able to sort of just cut and paste a method from a triple quadrupole detector system over to an ICPMS system was readily available. And so that's exactly what we did, and that's what that top uh, graphic is actually showing you. This is a gradient that we took straight off of the LC triple quad system that we had, the SIEX 5500 system, and we moved it directly over to the LC ICPMS system. Now the flow rates were a little bit different because we could actually handle a higher flow rate on the ICPMS system, uh, but overall we were able to go straight out of the box, no configuration to the chromatography, um, exact same mobile phases and compositions, so we had a method up and running very quickly. We didn't have to do anything specific just because we were using an ICPMS. However, if you look at this chromatogram, what you can uh, hopefully appreciate is we've got a peak there being identified as RT3 that's actually T3, and the RT3 and T4 peak are actually kind of smushed together. And now on a triple quadrupole, not a big deal. T3 and T4 have, or RT3 and T4 for that matter, have different masses. Uh, so we don't have to worry about the fact that the T4 peak is kind of swallowing up the RT3 peak in our chromatogram. However, on an ICPMS, this is a huge issue because, again, everything that goes into the mass spec is going to be uh, uh, vaporized, atomized, and ionized, so it's only going to be iodine coming out the other side, uh, not T4 or T3. So even though we could potentially cut and paste a method that we had seen, we were going to have to do a little bit of uh, LC configuration because we do need to get rid of this T4 interference from RT3. But that kind of highlights, I think, one of the most important aspects of this that we really have to be careful about um, is looking into the specificity, right? Anytime you use a new technology, the specificity can always kind of bite you if you haven't uh, come across those issues before. So fun with gradients. I'm going to pretend like it only took me three iterations to actually get this done, uh, but obviously that's not how LC works, at least that's not how I work for LC. But we did some scouting and we were able to actually fairly quickly be able to get baseline resolution of uh, T3, RT3, and T4, so that's the, um, that is the elution sort of uh, uh, order in which they come off. Uh, so T4 is the first peak that you see coming off, uh, followed by, uh, sorry, T3 is the first peak, RT3 is in the middle, and then T4 is the last peak to come off. Uh, so baseline resolution, um, great specificity, but again, even though we know that this is T3, RT3, and T4, the ICPMS is purely just looking at iodine. Uh, so again, iodine is really sort of the, the metal or the element that we're actually uh, measuring in this situation to give us the specificity for iodine. So assay performance objectives, so I'll spend just a couple of slides here at the end kind of showing you where this method is. Um, this isn't a method validation presentation, so I'm not going to show all the details there, but I will kind of give you the idea that overall the sensitivity is what sort of uh, sidelined this a little bit, uh, not to mention my time winding down uh, at AREP and, not, uh, and no longer having the ability to kind of continue to work on the project. Uh, but we were about threefold less sensitive than what we really wanted to be, uh, even using sort of a dilute and shoot as well as a concentration step. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with the older ICP that we were using and we had some ideas as to how we might be able to boost that sensitivity. But one of the really important experiments I think we needed to do, um, and I was very happy with the outcome, is we were able to put a very high concentration of T3 and we were able to put a very high concentration of T4, so this is about 100 times higher than what the AMR, the upper end of the AMR was, and then we were able to put in a normal amount of RT3, so about in the middle of the AMR for RT3. And this experiment's important because, as everybody knows, when you get very high concentrations of compounds, you can start having tailing. 
with a tandem mass spectrometer, if we have our samples uh, well resolved uh, by mass, we might not have to worry about that. But this could be a major issue for uh, an ICPMS where, again, we're only looking at iodine. Um, and so this gives us a lot of confidence that with the chromatography that we developed, we would easily be able to resolve these compounds uh, even if we had super physiological amounts of T3 and T4, uh, we'd still get a good measure of our T3. You can kind of see on the right um, what the chromatograms looked like uh, as we went from standard one, that was about 12.5 picograms per mil, uh, to standard four, which was 250 picograms per mil. You can see obviously some performance of QC1, QC2. Um, overall, we had a bit of an accuracy issue at the low end, and a lot of that had to do with sensitivity. And some of that had to do uh, more specifically uh, with some carryover that we actually had identified. And this becomes kind of interesting. I put column carryover here with a question mark. One of the really interesting things about ICPMS that we have to worry about is called memory effects in the spray chamber. Iodine is notorious for sticking in the spray chamber um, and being able to sort of bleed into that next sample. And so for that reason, we had a bit of a higher background, which was uh, inhibiting our sensitivity. But it did look like we had probably a little bit of column carryover, and so we would need to do a little bit of adjustments to make sure that we could actually reduce this. Now, one of the really interesting things about ICPMS that you can also do is you can do an infusion into that spray chamber. Um, and so uh, one of the questions that you might actually kind of have is, well, how are we going to do internal standard uh, compensation when we're not getting any kind of structures? You know, typically, we might have like a 13C analog uh, that we'd be looking at. And in this chromatogram, what I'm kind of showing you here um, is so ro some robustness with patients that also has internal standard in it. Um, so not necessarily looking at the area counts here, but again, just looking at from sample one to sample last, um, getting very good chromatography, very good uh, overall sensitivity, and not seeing a, a lot of drop off. And so this gets to that idea of robustness. You know, would we be able to push samples in over and over and over again and not have to worry about the background or not have to worry about sort of the uh, sensitivity dropping? And then in the top right, I kind of just show this idea of an internal standard infusion where you can kind of do a point to point correction um, and this is a way to be able to do normalization um, with an ICPMS uh, using a different element, a different mass that we'd be measuring. Um, so slightly different concept. And so putting in, the, in there just to really say that, you know, this is not just a simple cut and paste to a different technology. You know, there are different challenges like there are with any technology, um, but all of them are solvable um, and addressable for sure. <clears throat> so in summary, I have a couple minutes left. I just wanted to leave you with a couple of thoughts. So the first is that LCICPMS is a viable option for metal containing compounds. I think I was pretty well known for searching through everybody's uh, test catalog to see if there was anything we could do by ICPMS instead of by a, another type of uh, mass spectrometry. The analytical sensitivity for me was not as good. And again, I was on an Agilent 7700. And so um, we had proposed that maybe on a 7900, or even moving to some of the triple quad uh, ICPMSs that we might be able to reduce the background uh, and overall get our sensitivity to be better at the low end where we were looking for it. The lower cost of ICPMS is attractive. Again, it's only running in positive mode, and so some of the electronics and sort of the internal components are a little bit less, and so for that reason, uh, you know, very interesting sort of cost uh, lowered solution. The other thing to think about in regards to robustness is you oftentimes, when you talk to people who use ICPMS, you know, they'll talk about ICPMS instruments sort of in the back of trucks driving around the desert looking for water to test uh, very robust instruments. Uh, so for that reason, very interesting uh, applications that can be done with them. We also looked at high throughput capacity of the auto sampler. Hopefully I was able to kind of make the point um, that uh, we can uh, worry about capacity no matter where we're at, right? It's not just a high volume laboratory problem, but we all need to be thinking about capacity um, not only for planning for the future, um, but also just to make sure that we can make the most out of the instruments that we have. Touch briefly on the organics torch for any of those, for any of you who are ICPMS individuals, you'll know 95% acetonitrile is not something you can typically use, um, but using that organics torch with an oxygen flow is something uh, that allows you to go up to 95% acetonitrile. Uh, extremely helpful uh, to be able to have conventional chromatography to not have to go down the route of uh, any kind of ion exchange chromatography. And then the idea, too, with ICPMS is dilute and shoot. We're not worried about dirtiness of the instrument at this point. We're really just worried about uh, the LC system and what can the LC system handle. We know that the ICPMS system can actually handle diluted serum uh, uh, straight into uh, the system. 
So with that, I wanted to uh, thank you again for your attention, um, contact information in case for some reason I didn't get a chance to answer anything. If I didn't uh, cover something in more detail that you would like to have covered, happy to answer uh, any questions now or in the future. Uh, thanks again for your attention and to everybody for uh, helping with this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Strathman, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box down by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Dr. Strathman will answer as many questions as time permits. So the first question is, if a lab has experience with ICP-MS but not LC, how difficult is it to develop an LC-ICP-MS method? Yeah, so I think um, if you don't have experience with LC, I think LC is, is underappreciated in how complex it really can be. Um, so I think if a laboratory has ICPMS experiment experience, you've got a huge component to being able to essentially make sure that you're going to be using that method correctly. I had talked about, you know, iodine and having memory effects. Um, there are things called polyatomics that we don't typically deal with in triple quadrupole um, and other types of technology that we do in ICPMS. So it can't be overlooked that that's a huge amount of information uh, that's extremely valuable. But at the same time, you know, LC really can throw people for a loop when they've never done anything except uh, direct injection, which is really what the majority of ICPMS methods are. Um, and so I would say that a laboratory that has strong LC experience would most likely have an easier time transitioning to an LC ICPMS method than a laboratory that has ICPMS and transitioning to an LC ICPMS. That's sort of my own opinion. I'm sure there's a lot of people that might actually argue against that. Um, but I think that's sort of really just appreciating the complexity in uh, the LC sort of method development, uh, as well as sort of the ongoing maintenance and addressing of any kind of issues in the future. Looks like we have time for one more question. If a lab has experience with LC MSMS but not ICP MS, how difficult is it to translate methods to LC ICP MS? Yeah, so I think that's kind of the, the kind of the opposite side of that sort of situation. So I think I probably have overall addressed that pretty well. I really think that the, the LC portion can be complicated. Everybody knows, uh, I'm sure, that if you pick a method from the, uh, if you pick a method from the literature, the LC is most likely not going to go exactly as you had expected. Um, and you know, there's nuances to every type of technology, but I think really having the background in LC uh, is extremely valuable, um, specifically because of what we're going to need to do to ensure specificity as we go into an ICPMS system. Um, so I see a couple other questions. I don't know, is it okay if I go ahead and sort of uh, answer some of those questions as well? Sure. Would you like we me to time. ask them, or do you want to just jump in yourself? Just let me know. Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and try to run through a couple of questions as I, I kind of notice everybody kind of heading out. I know we're at the end of the hour. Um, it looks like they have a question about, are you doing the free hormones, and are the ratios of the analytes of added diagnostic value. Um, so this was not looking at free hormones, and I would uh, largely agree that I, I don't think the sensitivity that we have would be anywhere near enough to be able to do the free hormones uh, by LC ICPMS at this point. Um, however, I do think, as we had talked about, being able to kind of boost some of the sensitivity. You know, ICPMS is interesting because, you know, only about 2 to 3 percent of the sample actually makes it into the mass spectrometer. So there are ways to boost the overall sensitivity outside of just using a different technology, uh, but at the same time being able to actually look at uh, whether or not they're um, uh, a much lower sensitivity. In regards to sort of diagnostic value, um, you know, I, I definitely think sort of free hormones are of interest. Um, I talked about a scientist early, Julie Ray, she had a, a recent publication looking at chronic opioid and uh, unconventional sort of pain medication uh, such as gabapentin, pregabalin, looking at free hormone changes. Um, and so I, I definitely think that the idea between free and total hormones is something that has gotten a lot of attention, a lot of people are interested in, um, and there's definitely a lot of value in looking at free hormones. Whether or not there's value in free RT3, I won't wander into that. That's for an endocrinologist to discuss, not my area of expertise. Um, cost per run to get the three analytical values. Um, so pretty much it's in line with uh, what you would expect um, from an ICPMS assay that uses LC. So analogous to maybe a LC uh, ICPMS method for arsenic fractionation. Um, you know, we hadn't completely worked out the idea of would we be doing a dilute and shoot. Uh, I have seen some dilute and shoot serum methods that use LC. Um, certainly there's always a concern about robustness and clogging of columns, but using a guard column you might be able to get away with that and reduce the cost. So certainly not having to do any kind of extractions or anything like that would dramatically reduce the cost. 
Um, you know, the running of the ICPMS, I think, is probably cheaper than a triple quad. The maintenance is a bit cheaper, but some of that sort of works its way out in the wash as well. Um, so overall, I would say I don't have any perfect sort of or uh, finalized sort of cost numbers, but we definitely were predicting that it was going to be uh, cheaper for the laboratory to run by LC ICPMS as compared to LC triple quad, certainly if we could get rid of those maintenance bills. Uh, that was another kind of component as well. And then turnaround time comparison between triple quad and ICP. Um, so again, turnaround time, very subjective. Um, you know, the analysis time on the ICPMS versus the triple quad is nearly identical. Uh, the chromatography, you could see we had actually sped the chromatography up quite a bit, going from a 5.5 uh, injection to injection to about less than 1.5 minutes injection to injection. And that was really before we had kind of dialed in the overlapped injection um, and really gotten the columnar generation strategy finished. Um, so uh, overall, much faster. Um, so for that reason, um, I, I do think the turnaround time would be much better. Capacity overall would be good on the ICPMS uh, compared to the triple quad. So I think that's all the questions. So uh, thanks to everybody who submitted questions. And again, thanks to uh, uh, Sonia for moderating and for Agilent sponsoring and LabRoots for putting on this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I would like to once again thank Dr. Strathman for his presentation. Do you have any final comments? Uh, no, not at all. I hopefully uh, everybody found this educational. If you're using ICPMS, hopefully you can appreciate there's a lot more you can do with it than maybe what you've done. Uh, thank you to a couple of the different conferences. I had mentioned MSACL. They have an ICPMS track, which is fantastic. Uh, the Winter Conference on Plasma Spectrochemistry is another really great ICPMS conference. A lot of very cool research and also clinical applications in this area. Uh, so hopefully this has gotten everybody thinking a little bit about what type of technologies are out there um, and how we might be able to apply them differently than what we had uh, typically thought. Well, thank you again. And I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Those who have additional questions can send them to Dr. Strathman directly. We would also like to thank our sponsor, Agilent Technologies, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. This webcast can be viewed on demand through October 5th, 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>